Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Army Heritage and Education Center. My name is Jesse Fowler Parrott. I'm the Chief of Visitor Services here. We welcome you tonight to the August edition of our Perspectives in Military History Lecture Series. Before we begin, if there are any teachers in the audience, please see me afterwards to get the forms for, to file if you would like Act 48 credit for attending this event. We are going to begin tonight. I'm going to introduce our speaker, Mr. Barnett Schechter. Barnett Schechter is the author of The Devil's Own Work, The Civil War Draft Rise, and The Fight to Reconstruct America, and The Battle for New York, The City and the Heart of the American Revolution. He's an advisor for the New York Historical Society's upcoming exhibit, Lincoln and New York, and a contributor to a com the companion volume, a contributing editor of the three-volume Encyclopedia of the American Revolution and Landmarks of the American Revolution. He is also a contributor to the Encyclopedia of New York City. A fellow of the New York Academy of History, his lecture lectures, lead tours, and staff rides. He's appeared in a variety of television doc documentaries. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Barnett Schechter. Thank you, Jesse, for the warm welcome. I'm absolutely honored and delighted to be here at the Army uh, Heritage Education Center. Uh, the, the Civil War draft rights is a topic that I personally didn't learn much about in school. If you're like me, like most Americans, uh, you, you might have learned about it on your own. It's unfortunate because I, I feel that the draft rights are really a wonderful window on the entire Civil War and Reconstruction era which is what I'd like to talk to you about tonight. Um, the riots, a, a violent convulsion of five days that almost destroyed New York City in July of 1863, were really a kind of microcosm of the great issues of the Civil War. The question of slavery or freedom for African Americans, and the question of the scope of federal power over states and individuals. Uh, I'm gonna advance the first slide here and talk a little bit about the basics of the story, the Army recruitment in 1863. I also just wanted to say it's, it's exciting to be here at Carlisle talking about the draft riots because it's not simply a New York City story. Um, many people don't realize that the draft riots, as they unfolded from July 13th, really through the 17th or 18th of July, really were enmeshed in the story of the Gettysburg campaign. Um, and in fact, if you think about it, the riots erupted just 10 days after the last day of the Gettysburg Battle. In fact, many Northerners believed that the riots were supposed to erupt in conjunction with Lee's advance into Pennsylvania, and that they were only postponed for 10 days because of his defeat at Gettysburg. In fact, uh, the Republican abolitionist newspaper editor Horace Greeley uh, published in his newspaper an anti-Lincoln uh, handbill that appeared all over New York City on the eve of Independence Day, on July 3rd, 1863. And he argued that that was evidence that the riots were really supposed to erupt um, right on July 4th, and to be, in a sense, a fire in the rear during, uh, during the Confederate invasion of the North. Uh, and that's a, a theme that I'll want to talk to you about as we go along, but the question of whether the relationship of the draft riots and the Gettysburg campaign was, let's say, conspiracy <laughs> or concerted military plan or simply coincidence um, is something that we can look at over the next uh, 30 minutes or so. Now, 1863, as I'm sure you know, was a dark moment in the war for the North. Uh, we had um, Fredericksburg, uh, and in December of 62, uh, Chancellorsville, a series of battles leading to, uh, to General Lee's sense of invincibility leading up to his invasion of Pennsylvania, and of course, a desperate need for men in the Northern forces. Congress on March 2nd of 1863 signed, uh, passed what was the first federal draft in U.S. history, the first direct conscription of men into a national army. 
course, bypassing for the first time the power of state governors to draft men into, into the state militia. Um, a tremendous watershed in terms of federal power, uh, clearly. And the, ki the kicker with this new draft law, of course, was that there was an exemption clause, a commutation clause. If you could present a substitute or pay the government $300, you could be exempt from the draft. Now, $300 in 1863, if you were working in New York City on a dock or in a factory, uh, you were maybe making a dollar a day. So we're talking almost a year's salary. Uh, no problem for the Andrew Carnegie's, uh, J.P. Morgan's, and Mellon's, but uh, if you were uh, a factory worker, you would have to pool your money and create, as they did, draft insurance uh, so that if one of your buddies were drafted, you would, uh, you would put up the money to get, get him out. Um, so clearly a piece of class discrimination um, in this law. It was also designed as a kind of, if you will, a carrot and stick approach um, on the part of uh, Edwin Stanton, the Secretary of War. Um, the idea being, as you can see from this illustration of a, a recruiting booth in uh, what's now City Hall Park in New York City, you could see that they were also offering $300 as a bounty if you volunteered. So there was reward um, if, you, if you could volunteer or if you could uh, gain exemption with that same amount. But as you could see, there were state, county, and local bounties. Um, cities raised money. And the draft was, was really intended to try to increase, increase uh, volunteerism if possible. Now, Here you see an image of what happened when the lottery for the draft began on July 13th, 1863, a Monday, Monday morning. Uh, now, of course, enrollment for the, the collection of all the names had transpired during the spring, uh, during April, May, and June. And the names were put in a drum and drawn randomly by blindfolded uh, clerk. And this is at 46th Street and 3rd Avenue, and you can see what happened when the crowds gathered and resentment erupted over this $300 exemption clause. The cry, of course, went up. It was a rich man's war and a poor man's fight. And the draft office was burned, uh, the names, the records, and in fact, the entire city block uh, at 46th and 3rd Avenue was burned to the ground. And you could see how the, the riots progressed during the first days of the riot, uh, which lasted almost a week. You could see the general drift of the rioters from the industrial areas of the city, uh, from the docks in the Lower East Side, uh, from the, the machine yards, the shipyards on the East Side in the 20s. And as the, the riot gained steam, moving down from 46th and 3rd, it started to take on a different character, which was not only attacking political targets, the draft office, uh, the home of the Republican mayor, um, and armories where weapons could be found, but it started to take on the character of a racial pogrom. And what you see here is the burning of the colored orphan asylum at 44th Street and 5th Avenue, which is two blocks north of uh, New York's public library today. And the riots degenerated into the most horrific kind of violence. You can see the lynchings. Um, see the crowds here, a depiction of the same scene. New York's population at the time was about 800,000, um, many of them immigrants. A quarter of the population was Irish, uh, Irish Americans. Only a small fraction, about 12,500, were free blacks. But it was uh, a community that suffered tremendous disruption. Some of the um, more famous leaders of this black community at the time, professional, educated community. Um, this was James McCune Smith, America's first accredited black physician. He was the attending physician at the, at the Colored Orphan Asylum, where there were about 230 children, who thankfully all escaped 
um, Henry Highland Garnett, a black minister who uh, took care of the population in the wake of the riots. We're talking about some 5,000 blacks who were basically rendered homeless and penniless by, this, by the riots by the end of the week, uh, about 40% of, of the free black population. Now, the question, of course, is how did uh, a political protest degenerate into this kind of violence? Well, clearly there was another ingredient. And what I haven't mentioned, of course, is what happened on January 1st, 1863, just six months earlier, the Emancipation Proclamation. And so uh, there was a, there's a wonderful quote from a, a British visitor to New York at the time who was looking around in shock at blacks being chased through the streets off of docks into the rivers, being lynched from lampposts. He said, why are they attacking the blacks over the draft? And this, someone took time out from the rioting and said, well, of course, they're the innocent cause of all of this. And what he meant, of course, was that Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation threatened to free four million blacks, and Lincoln's opponents had harped on this, told the white working class that these blacks were going to come and take their jobs, while the rich stayed home, and they were sent to die on the war front. And so this toxic mix of political agitation by Lincoln's opponents in the Democratic Party uh, sparked this, this uh, tinderbox of New York City. It, this cartoon uh, takes a, a somewhat humorous view, but it's, I think, a, a really sophisticated summation of where things stood in, uh, in the beginning of 1863. It gives you a sense of the frustration of the Union Army on the battlefield, uh, trying to break the back of the Confederacy. Um, you see all the key players, uh, Halleck, McClellan, Stanton, Lincoln, uh, each using one more tool to try to uh, win the war. And of course, uh, the draft that's being depicted here in the arms of, of Stanton was actually the militia draft of 1862, which was a kind of precursor to the direct federal draft of 1863. The summer of 62, the militia law was changed so that the um, federal government could actually uh, bring in militiamen for more than uh, the, the statutory 30 days, but actually for nine months. Um, and this was a, a buildup to, uh, just as Lincoln's preliminary emancipation proclamation of September 62 led to the, the final issuing of the proclamation in January 63. Um, and so really what you see here is Lincoln saying that the Emancipation Proclamation was a tool of war, that, it, that he needed to do it in order to, to break the back of the Confederacy, to talk about a fire in the rear, right, to, to uh, unleash the power of freed slaves behind Confederate lines, and also to add uh, the strength of, of black soldiers to the Union Army. Um, aside, of course, from the moral uh, rightness of the act, which Lincoln personally espoused. Uh, but as, just as Lincoln saw the Emancipation Proclamation as a kind of um, way of breaking the back of the Confederacy, in a sense, the proclamation was the last straw uh, of aggravation uh, and opposition uh, from Lincoln's, for Lincoln's opponents. It was a revolutionary act for men like Fernando Wood, uh, leaders of the Democratic Party, fierce opponents of Lincoln, peace Democrats who wanted to end the war with the South by negotiation to preserve slavery. Um, while the Emancipation Proclamation, as some have said, did not free a single slave, or as uh, Secretary of State Seward said, kept them in slavery where we did have control over them in the border states and freed them by decree where we didn't have control in the, uh, in the rebellious states. While it had all of those uh, limitations to it, nonetheless, the Emancipation Proclamation revolutionized the purposes of the Civil War. Simply by that act, Lincoln said, this is no longer a war to conserve, to pr preserve the Union, simply. It is also a war uh, of abolition, that the Union armies are going to have to do more than win a set-piece battle. 
and negotiate a peace. They're going to have to march through the heart of the Confederacy and destroy slavery and its roots and, and reconstruct Southern society um, from the ground up. And so for men like Fernando Wood, who was the three-term mayor of New York in the, seven, in the 1850s, nine-term congressman uh, in the Reconstruction era after the war, uh, a, a veritable political Lazarus, um, and as some would say, the, the spiritual uh, progenitor of the, of the draft riots, Wood um, was a, a staunch opponent of the Republican administration, and he espoused um, the views of many Democrats at the time. Now, of course, when I'm talking about the Democrats and Republicans, it should be clear that the Democrats, of course, were um, the party of, of Jefferson and Jackson um, that embraced uh, the immigrant population, including the uh, many Irish Catholics who were emigrating to New York in this period. Uh, the Republican Party, of course, being a brand new phenomenon of the, 17, of the 1850s, um, a party created expressly for the purpose of containing slavery, if not abolishing it altogether. So um, when we're talking about Lincoln's opponents here, I, I'm talking about the Democrats. And of course, they had a list of complaints against the president, one of them, of course, being his impingements on civil rights for the sake of national security. And what you're looking at here is uh, a federal prison. Uh, you're familiar with the Verrazano Bridge between Staten Island and, Western, and, and Brooklyn. Well, where the Eastern Pier stood, it stands today, uh, stood Fort Lafayette. And you could see it just off the shore there. And this was where prisoners were brought. And of course, Lincoln and Congress had suspended the writ of habeas corpus. Um, and you can see here uh, prisoners being brought into the fort. So that, of course, was one complaint. Um, and in general, Democrats, including the, the governor of New York State, uh, Horatio Seymour, uh, complained that, that Lincoln was aggrandizing too much power in the federal government trampling on states' rights in the North. Um, and he, he actually warned that there would be violence. Um, Seymour predicted that, that riots would break out in reaction to this kind of um, what he considered high-handed authority. Now, when I say that the story of, of resistance to the draft went beyond the confines of New York City, um, should, be, should be aware that all across the North, um, wherever Working men were gathered. Here, in the case of the, the marble quarries in Vermont, uh, you see a factory here, or right here in Pennsylvania in the, in the coal fields. Here, you see the Molly Maguires organizing. And again, in, in terms of resistance to Lincoln's policies, there was a layering of many factors. The battle lines in the draft riots really consisted not only of the immediate politics, but as I've indicated, there were racial, as it, there was a racial component. There was also a religious component, a Protestant versus Catholic. Um, and especially in the, in the coal mines, there was already uh, a layer of labor conflict between management and workers, um, which often uh, aligned with, with Catholic Protestant uh, identity. And so, the, um, the resistance to the draft, actually the first draft officials who were killed in the, in the spring of 63 were in Indiana. Um, and there were disturbances in Chicago and all across the, the Midwest as well as uh, in New York. But it really came to a, a peak in New York because of um, several factors. Now here you see a Republican cartoon denouncing the, the Democratic governor, Horatio Seymour, who not only opposed Lincoln's policies, but uh, came into the city and in a sense negotiated with the rioters. The democratic approach to trying to quell the disturbance was not an iron fist, but rather to try to talk to people in the streets and promise them that there would be redress for this blatant class discrimination and that somehow uh, through the courts, uh, the draft would be, would be equalized. And what you see here is directly with the, with the Republican Tribune office in the background, 
you see uh, Seymour addressing the crowd as my friends. Now, whether he did so or not, <laughs> uh, eventually became immaterial. This accusation dogged him for the rest of his political career, uh, and even up to his run for uh, presidential uh, in the presidential election of 1868. Uh, but clearly, he had come to the city too late uh, he, from his vacation in, in New Jersey, and uh, not quick enough for the for the Republicans. Now. The riots are often described, and were at the time, as an Irish phenomenon. Um, of course, there had been uh, numerous famines in Ireland, uh, most acutely the Great Hunger in 1845 to 52, um, which had brought um, more than a million Irish to, to American shores. And there's no mistaking that the greater part of the working population the working class in New York, that 200,000, uh, was Irish or Irish American. Um, but the Irish were not a monolithic body. Um, and certainly they were not the only rioters. And many of them were on the other side. Uh, they were in the police force. They were in the army. Uh, there were 300,000 Irish or Irish Americans who served in the Union forces, probably 30,000 in the Confederate side. Um, but the point being that some of the, the staunchest Unionists were Irishmen. Uh, in this case, uh, Colonel Robert Nugent of the 69th Regiment, New York Volunteers, uh, who was a, a war hero, had led the doomed charge of Mary's Heights during the Battle of Fredericksburg, was wounded um, and brought to New York, back home to New York to convalesce. And lo and behold, he was put in charge of enforcing the draft. Uh, <laughs> a kind of perfect uh, figure for understanding the kind of dilemma uh, of the Irish and the, the complexity of the different shades of viewpoints among the Irish community. But I think it, it really sums up um, a kind of dilemma that the Irish faced by 1863, and you read it in um, accounts of the time, that the Irish had poured heart and soul into the Union war effort from the beginning. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Corcoran's Legion, uh, Thomas, Francis Thomas Mahar's um, uh, Irish Brigade, um, and of course Nugent as well here, uh, there was a sense of, of wanting to defend the Union because it had provided asylum to uh, religious uh, and political and economic asylum to uh, famine-afflicted Irish throughout the, the 19th century, and because it was a, a young democracy that they wanted to see succeed. Um, and also, of course, there was the sense that this was a trial run for a war of independence against Britain uh, back in Ireland. And a lot of the training uh, of men like Nugent took place in, in militia units during the, seven, during the 1850s. Um, and of course, he was a leader of the, of the Fenian Brotherhood, an Irish nationalist um, organization. And so, then, like Nugent, when they saw the draft riots erupt, um, here we see the, the Irish uh, 69th going off to war. When they saw the draft riots erupt, their reaction was to put them down, give them grape and plenty of it, um, put the thing down mercilessly. And in fact, that's, that's what happened. Um, after things grew out of control for a few days, um, the 550 regular army troops, that's all that were left and remember, I talked about the, the coincidence with the Gettysburg campaign. New York City and New York State were, had essentially been stripped of their defenses because Governor Seymour, who may have been uh, sympathetic to, to the Southern uh, secession, was nonetheless a patriot. And when Lincoln called, he sent troops. Um, thousands of militia uh, were sent down from New York to respond to the emergency of Lee's invasion at the end of June, and so there were 550 troops left in the eight uh, harbor forts in, around New York City, uh, and maybe a 1,000 uh, militiamen left. And so with that small body of troops, uh, General John Wool and, and Harvey Brown um, sent the men through the streets with artillery, uh, anti-personnel canister and grape shot, and firing by platoons into the crowds. <coughs> 
Uh, it was a, a bloody business, and it helps to explain why these draft riots, 146 years ago this week, uh, still rank as the deadliest riots in American history. And it was certainly the largest civil insurrection uh, and perhaps the largest uh, rebellion after the Civil War itself. Um, and it was this kind of uh, confrontation that um, ac accounted for a death toll of more than 100 confirmed dead uh, and hundreds more wounded and probably closer to 500 actually killed. Uh, and at the same time, I, I talked about Horace Greeley, who you see on your left. Uh, there was a, a war going on in the newspapers, uh, the abolitionists um, against the Democrats. And here what you see is Printing House Square, which was the, uh, where all the newspapers in, in New York City were published and distributed right across from City Hall. You can see the Tribune over above Greeley's head. That was in the background in that City Hall uh, speech by that cartoon of Seymour. And what you had was uh, a continuous uh, fight going on in the press. You see Manton Marble over here on the right, um, the editor of the New York World, who continued to pour fuel on the flames, um, attacking the Lincoln administration and uh, race baiting, even as the, the streets were erupting and buildings were burning and the city was, was nearly consumed. Um, and of course, Horace Greeley, who had been uh, hectoring President Lincoln to free the slaves, um, not knowing that he had the Emancipation Proclamation ready in his pocket uh, for months, Greeley set himself up as, as the, the real um, gadfly of the, of the radical Republican Party. And so when the riots broke out, he and his office became a target for the mobs. And that's, of course, what you see in this image of uh, hundreds of rioters attacking the Tribune office, but at the same time, a phalanx of about 100 uh, New York City policemen coming up from Nassau Street and crashing into the mob with their locust sticks. Um, one of the, uh, the personal accounts of, the, of this incident says it, it sounded like raindrops falling on, on glass, the tap, tap, tap of the locust clubs on cracking skulls in the square. Um, a horrific scene uh, which saved the Tribune. Um, the New York Times building probably saved itself. The editor, uh, Henry Raymond, had set up a Gatling gun in one of the windows, uh, which I, I think had been sent to him by Henry Ward Beecher, the abolitionist preacher in Brooklyn. Um, and so the Tribune and the Times together uh, had turned themselves into kind of arsenals with uh, uh, grenades and um, artillery that they'd gotten from the Navy Yard across the East River. Um, now, th there's an incredible story about how one of uh, Greeley's men went down to the docks, uh, you know, Shanghai a boat, and then got over to the Navy Yard, got the, the guns, the muskets, the rifled muskets back to the building, and then learned that all of the, the ammunition was the wrong size <laughs> for these crates uh, full, of, uh, full of guns but he made a big show of moving the crates into the building, and that in itself was enough of a deterrent <laughs> to keep some of the mob away. Um, now Greeley, of course, um, I, I mentioned at the beginning the idea that the draft riots might actually be not simply a spontaneous working class rebellion against uh, a patently discriminatory law, but perhaps might be a concerted element of Confederate military strategy. And that's exactly what Henry Raymond and uh, of the Times and, and Greeley believed, was that this was a plot that had been hatched in Richmond, that there were Confederate agents in the streets coordinating the mobs um, through this week of, of murder and mayhem. And of course, when they discussed Confederate sympathizers, they called them copperheads. Um, the, the, the caption, of course, saying that they were in favor not of prosecuting the war, but of, in, a, in favor of a vigorous prosecution of peace uh, at the negotiating table. And of course, they were considered traitors within the tra snakes in the grass within the, the borders of the loyal states. Now, 
In retrospect, this may sound like an hysterical conspiracy theory, but let me give you a few more elements that made it seem somewhat credible at the time. Uh, now, of course, this, this map is, uh, deals with all of the major campaigns. Of course, we're talking about the Gettysburg campaign up here. Uh, but something that's not on the map that I wanted to mention to you is that in early July of 63, right as Lee was invading Pennsylvania, end of June, um, John Hunt Morgan, Confederate cavalry commander, was leading a somewhat unauthorized uh, incursion into Indiana and Ohio with about 2,500 troopers. Uh, and we can actually see some, um, here's John Hunt Morgan, and some depictions of his attempt to destabilize the Midwestern states right about the time of, of the Gettysburg campaign and the draft riots. Um, his plan was to um, pillage certain cities, to, to attack Indianapolis and free some thousand Confederate prisoners that were held there. And if he couldn't get back across uh, the Ohio River to safety with the Federals in, in pursuit, his plan was to head east through Ohio and to join forces with Lee in Pennsylvania. And that much we have on record that, that, that he intended to do that. Um, now, it's interesting that the, the Confederates actually did think that there might be some uh, grounds for attaching the Midwest to the Confederate cause. And of course, there was a lot of discontentment in the Midwest. The, the closing off of the Mississippi River had created tremendous um, economic uh, hard times, the failure of businesses and farms, a lot of resentment toward the Republican administration in Washington. And however, there was a certain uh, wishful thinking element in the Confederates trying to break the Midwest off as a partner um, in the Civil War because this disgruntlement was not really up to the level of, of complete, uh, uh, complete break with the North. And, and so, what uh, Morgan and his men encountered was not so much open arms, but uh, people fighting back and thinking about them as no better than horse thieves, who they just wanted to, uh, to fend off when they came through their towns. And you can see some of the, um, the action of, of Morgan's raids through some of the small towns in Indiana. Now, the idea of the, of the conspiracy theory that, that the draft riots were planned to coincide with, uh, with Lee's campaign really um, does not, is not supported by any particular documentary evidence. And in fact, I think the, the arguments against it, the arguments that this was a complex uh, event with deep roots uh, of decades in the making is really uh, probably more on the mark. And, what I want to do is take you a little bit through, uh, through New York City in a little bit more detail so you can see what I mean. Um, the draft riots really had, had deep economic and social roots um, that we can trace back really, I think, um, into the late 1820s. Um, now, what you see here is a view of South Street, and it's a reminder that New York in the 19th century was a maritime economy. And I think what many forget is that the, the most valuable export of New York City in 1860 was cotton. That the city was inextricably bound up in its commercial ties to southern agriculture. Uh, while the city, after secession, became the financial, commercial, and industrial hub of the North, uh, before the war, um, its banks were financing year after year the, the cotton crop, uh, transshipping the cotton through New York to England, insuring it, uh, producing the, uh, the manufactured goods, the machinery that were used in the South. And so there was, beyond an economic tie, eventually a cultural bond that evolved. And so New York, uh, when the war came along, was very reluctant uh, to have this rupture and, of course, to lose hundreds of millions of dollars in loans uh, to, uh, to southern planters. And 
What that meant, of course, was that the working classes, who we saw erupting in the riots, uh, were left in a, in a precarious position uh, in a rapidly developing American economy, which was discovering industrial capitalism, the factory system, interchangeable parts, all of these kind of technological innovations in the 50 years before the Civil War. Um, think about uh, the first paved roads, canals, railroads, telegraph, a tremendous revolution in communications and transportation and the modes of production, which put workers in an ever more menial position uh, and with less leverage in relation to, uh, to the factory owners. And of course, as New York became more industrialized as a city, without adequate, uh, no subway, no, uh, no elevated, you had a half million workers crammed into the lower portion of Manhattan, trying to get as close to the factories as they could so they could show up at the gate in the morning to get work uh, and might be laid off the next day for months at a time. Um, you also saw the de development of cities, rapid peri a period of rapid urbanization, and of course some of the worst slums on the planet. Um, here you see the famous Five Points in midsummer, uh, people out on the street. Uh, what's interesting is you can also see a certain level of racial integration. You see the blacks and whites uh, eating watermelon together over there in the corner. Um, an interesting facet of the draft riots was the level to which they, they created a segregated city where it hadn't existed before. It drove blacks uh, to the perimeters of, of white society um, in ways that, that hadn't been seen before. Again, you see the blacks and the whites together in, the, in this groggery, um, these, these groceries where liquor was served, which were kind of the nerve centers of the democratic ward healers of, of Tammany Hall. Um, and here you see some of the, the worst uh, elements of poverty with a, a, a five points lodging cellar uh, people just paying pennies a night for a place to sleep, one on top of another, in basements that were essentially below sea level on, on Manhattan, so that they, they flooded at high tide. There was moss growing on the walls. Um, the most kind of dismal squalor you can imagine. Here you actually see a, a view of one of the streets um, that led into the Five Points. And so it becomes much easier to understand how this kind of pressure cooker of economic despair uh, combined with uh, political, a sense of political grievance could explode uh, as it did on the streets in the summer of 1863. Now, the question becomes how did all of the pieces get picked up in the wake of the, of the riot? Now, of course, I said it started on a Monday morning um, and it peaked around uh, Wednesday, July 15th, and then really didn't end until Thursday of that week when troops were brought back. And of course, again, everything in concert with what was happening at Gettysburg. It wasn't until Lee had actually fled over the, back over the Potomac after the battle that Stanton was willing to send five regiments back from the, the battlefront to try to put down the, the last remnants of the rioters in New York City. Um, and so that wasn't until the 16th and 17th that they flushed out the last rioters on the east side, who were, some of them were snipers on the rooftops um, shooting at the soldiers. And the question then, of course, became how to proceed. Lincoln insisted that the draft must resume, but how to do it without more violence? And that, of course, is where famous Boss Tweed stepped in, who you see here. Um, the Democratic political machine stepped in and said, we want to protect our constituents, um, just as Seymour, you saw Seymour, um, trying to talk to the crowds, talk them down without shooting at them. Boss Tweed was riding in the carriage with Seymour that day, going around the city, trying to calm, calm things down. He created what he called the Substitute Committee, a brilliant compromise uh, 
brilliant, but also requiring a great deal of public money, which was Tammany's way. Uh, it floated $2 million in bonds uh, and said, OK, we'll use this to hire substitutes. And if any man is so poor that his family is going to be destitute, but if he's drafted, he can come to this committee, apply, and we will pay the commutation, the $300 fee, for him. And so Lincoln agreed to the plan. That he would get his troops, the substitutes, um, and the volunteers who would be brought in by the $2 million bond. And the, the unfairness of the law would be mitigated by Tweed's committee. And that's, in fact, what happened. The draft resumed peacefully in August. And Tweed and, and the Tammany ward healers went around and told people not to riot, that they would be uh, the fee would be paid for them if needed. And the war proceeded, and, and Lincoln had his men. Now, what, what's interesting are some of the other legacies of the riot, the real legacies of the riot, um, positive ones. Here, um, I'm sure you're familiar with the, the, the great martyrdom of the 54th, Massachusetts 54th, um, at Fort Wagner in South Carolina. But I think what many people don't remember is that this happened on July 18th, 1863. And its impact on the national consciousness was tremendous, coming as it did a day after the draft riots had been quelled in New York City. The national conscience reeled in, in abhorrence at the idea that these brave black soldiers were sacrificing their lives and their wives and children and nephews and nieces and grandparents were being slaughtered at the same time on the streets of New York City. And so the horror of the draft riots at least had one positive legacy in uh, drawing attention to the, um, to the bravery of, of black troops. And not only at Fort Wagner, but Fort Hudson, uh, numerous other battles. Um, and of course, the blacks eventually um, contributed a, a huge proportion of troops uh, to the Union victory. Now, some of the other legacies of the draft riots are more uh, complex and more sinister. Um, what you see here is a cartoon from 1868. This is a, a Thomas Nast classic. Um, and of course, anything with Thomas Nast, we have to sort of weigh both sides. He was a tremendous Republican uh, propagandist. Lincoln said his, his drawings were worth 100,000 men in the field for the Union cause. Um, but at the same time, of course, he was a tremendous uh, nativist, uh, an anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic bigot. Um, and of course, you could see all of it right here in this cartoon, where you see the, the black soldier that we've just talked about um, being trampled on in the wake of the war. The, um, of course, this is um, the CSA, the Confederate States of America. Um, in the center, August Belmont, the Democratic financier. Um, Nathan Bedford Forrest, I, sh I should have said, in the middle. Um, and the five points. Uh, slum dweller with his one vote um, on the left here. And this, this kind of unholy trinity of the Democratic Party, again, manipulating the white working class, adopting them because they're white and they have a vote. Um, and the idea was, of course, and the reality was that the Democratic Party, having been split in two, north and south, been on the ropes uh, during the whole Civil War, began to put itself back together uh, during Reconstruction. And the New, York's, uh, New York City party leaders really directed the party nationally. And they expressed a great deal of sympathy for home rule in the South. Uh, and what you see, you, you probably can't see, but I can tell you in the background of this picture, if you were to see it up close, you can see on, the le on your left the burning colored orphan asylum. And on the, on the right, Nast compares it to the burning of the freedmen's schools that were set up to help emancipated blacks in the South 
during Reconstruction and to the activities of, of the Klan. And so despite all of his uh, bigotry, there's, there's an interesting point that's being made here, which I think is that the draft riots were really uh, the first outburst in a long campaign of racial violence that would continue for decades after the Civil War. The lynching that we would see in the South by the KKK and lynchings all over the country that persisted into the 1930s was really a kind of campaign of anti-Reconstruction violence. And so with the, the point I've been making, I think, throughout is that the draft was about not only the draft, but it was also about the Emancipation Proclamation, which was really the event that inaugurated the entire era, the entire idea of Reconstruction. And the draft riots were the first battle of that, of that era, um, a great outcry against the end of slavery and an attempt to put bl blacks into a continuing condition of, of servitude, a kind of caste system, even after slavery had been destroyed. Um, and so that, of course, is, is what happened with the disputed election of 1876. Uh, the Democrats essentially won the election by the numbers, but conceded the White House to the Republicans in exchange for a withdrawal of the last federal troops from the defeated Confederacy uh, in, 1870, in 1877. Um, and that's really where I end my story, really taking on a kind of a 50-year chunk of time from 1827 to 57, um, from the end of slavery in New York State by statute um, until the demise of Reconstruction in 1877. And I, I want to end it on a note of also acknowledging the struggles that would lay ahead not only for blacks with a century almost of Jim Crow uh, that, would, that would survive into the 1950s and 60s, but also the plight of the white workers, those who, let's say, didn't join the, the lynch mobs in New York in July of 63, but still had a legitimate grievance about, uh, about the conditions of the poor and working people in America. And they would face a struggle uh, to organize themselves for better conditions. And what we see in the last quarter of the 19th century is really the most violent period of labor conflict in American history. And those troops that were brought out of the South, um, some of them also stationed in a new crop of armories that sprung up all over the North, many would be used to put down labor strikes um, throughout the, the country. And here, of course, you see the great strike of 1877, a railroad strike that turned into a general strike across the country and resulted in much rioting here uh, seen in Chicago, 1877. And so really my tale is a tragedy of two groups of people, African Americans and, and white working men, women and children for that matter, uh, who were pitted against each other largely um, by the connivance of uh, opposition politicians in the Civil War era, uh, but they were in fact groups that would discover in the long run that they had very much in common. So I'll leave it there and welcome your questions. Thank you. In the preceding slide, I'm not sure I can identify the object in the lower right hand corner, but does it have symbolism? It looks like half of an hourglass or something else. Yeah, you know, I have puzzled. The question was, what's the object in the lower right? It looks like a half of an hourglass. I have puzzled over that, but I do not know. <laughs> okay. well, do you have a theory? No, everything okay. else seems to have some kind of yeah. you know, message with it, but I wondered about that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it symbolizes that the country's running out of time. <laughs> Were there similar riots in cities like Philadelphia and Boston? Yeah, there were riots in other cities, uh, particularly in Boston. Although in Boston, um, of course, on a smaller scale, smaller population, uh, but and also there was some sense of anticipation of it, and so it was put down much more quickly. But there was uh, one instance, at least, of troops uh, firing a cannon into a crowd and, and killing and maiming people. But um, if you read the letters of sort of the city fathers in New York, after the riots, they said, 
New York, uh, that Boston was an object lesson in the proper way to, to deal with such violence, to, to nip it in the bud. Um, Philadelphia, there weren't specifically draft riots, but what I do examine in my book is uh, the racial tensions and the kind of endemic uh, rioting that existed in Philadelphia, uh, you know, particularly from the late 1820s to the 1840s. Uh, tremendous amount of, of racial rioting and also rioting of, of nativists uh, attacking immigrants, particularly Irish Catholics. Go ahead. Okay. Um, was there any evidence that, or I guess the question is, what were what the word bosses doing? Were they were they claiming it or trying to put it down, or were they just out of was it just totally out of control right. during the riots? So. Right. That's an interesting question. What were the Democratic ward bosses doing? Um, it's interesting because it's not what you would expect. Uh, in fact, you know, I talked a bit about the Five Points neighborhood, and I think there's a, a persistent misconception that most of the rioters came pouring out of the Five Points. In fact, it turns out that the ward bosses there had gone around and calmed people down and said, don't riot, you're just going to reap damage onto yourself more than anybody else, which of course is what happened. More, the, the highest death toll was among the, the rioters themselves. And, um, but, so it was exactly perhaps the opposite of what one might think. The, the Democrats were going around trying to calm people down. In some cases it worked, in some it didn't. The examinations, did you look at anything comparable that would have happened in the South? Were the attitudes anywhere near similar? very dissimilar? Attitudes so regarding the draft? Insofar as, as recruitment yeah. and retention. Yeah. Um, it's a, a great question. What was going on with recruitment, retention, um, and the draft in the South? Now, I think I might have said that the, the draft law of March 63 was the first federal draft in U.S. history. I chose my words carefully because actually the Confederacy imposed a draft first. So uh, they, they actually imposed a draft in 1862, and there were somewhat similar results. Um, there was a lot of resistance to it, um, you know, particularly when the, the draft officials would go up into the upland counties of certain states. Um, there was more support for the Confederacy in the, low, you know, the tidewater areas where the planters were. Um, and so there were, there was violent resistance uh, to the draft. Also, uh, the draft in the South had a, an element of class discrimination as well. Uh, if, you know, people who were, um, for example, a foreman on a plantation that had 20 slaves or more was exempt. Um, and uh, slave owners with a certain number of slaves. So there was clearly the same kind of outcry of rich man's war, poor man's fight going on in the South as well. Um, and this is related to the question that was asked earlier. It, the, the riot went on for so long, uh, and it's, the rioters seem to be very selective in their targets, which implies that it wasn't just the spontaneous outrun of rage, uh, but that there was some sort of organization behind it. And I'm wondering if you found any evidence that Right. The question of organization among the rioters is uh, fascinating and elusive, and it's something that I examine and pursue throughout uh, my research and, and throughout the narrative in my book. And the, the short answer is I came up with no documentary evidence to suggest a, a preconcerted plan. Um, I mentioned Greeley, uh, Greeley mentioned the, um, the handbill that had been distributed uh, on the eve of the 4th of July, uh, but that was not specifically calling people to riot. Um, there were uh, anecdotal accounts 
where people said, well, there seemed to be a core of 300 men at the center of each larger mob who were directing things. Um, there were stories about men who had been discovered with workmen's clothes, but then underneath they had uh, um, fine silk or you know, gentleman's clothing underneath and uncalloused hands, suggesting that they were sort of the genteel uh, copperhead instigators. There all, there's all kinds of anecdotal evidence. There was even um, members of the Union League Club, which was, of course, the great um, staunch supporter of the war effort, uh, pushed Lincoln to try to have a congressional or federal investigation to go and identify the, the ringleaders of the riots. But even the men who, who pushed that idea, when pressed, never left names. They never accused anyone by name. They never left any documents. Um, so it, there are you know, suggestions of organization. For example, um, in that one of the first slides I showed you, um, you can see that they were uh, chopping down the telegraph lines and the telegraph poles which suggested more than simple rage. It suggested they were trying to cut New York City off from communication from outside, from Washington, from upstate. They were pulling up train tracks, which would prevent relief by, by volunteers. In fact, the, the men coming from the Gettysburg front um, switched to boats when they entered the city at the Jersey Shore, came in by boat. Um, so there were elements that, that uh, were suggestive of some sort of concerted plan, but nothing really conclusive. Um, how did the draft riots affect um, troop morale in, existent, in the existent troops? Did it, did it have a great impact on the uh, army that were occupied? Yeah, yeah the, the question of impact on troop morale, if I can back up six months, it's also interesting to, to question what was the impact of troop morale uh, on troop morale of the Emancipation Proclamation. That was something that Lincoln worried about quite a bit. And one reason he held, held it in reserve from really when he started writing it in July of 62, and then tentatively issued it in September uh, 62, and then waited again till January, till, uh, you know, the, well, first he waited for the victory at Antietam, um, and, then, and then waited till January, which was the, the line in the sand that he had drawn with the first proclamation. But of course, yeah, there was the question of uh, how would Union soldiers react to fighting a new kind of war, not simply for the Union, but for abolition. Um, and then, as you say, the, the, and of course, um, there were many who were alienated, um, and as I suggested, particularly Irish troops who had sacrificed thinking they were fighting for one war and not another. Um, the question of the draft riots, I, from what I've been able to, to gather from soldiers' letters, uh, it was a sense of outrage, a sense uh, against the rioters, a sense of, you know, there's one Irishman wrote, you know, why don't those skulking blowers at home get out here and fight, you know? I mean, the, the sense of do your job. Um, and on the other hand, some of the, uh, there's some of the militiamen who got back to New York from Gettysburg a day too late to participate in the, in the quelling of the riots, saying you know, they were disappointed <laughs> that they hadn't, hadn't been there to, for the fight. Um, because they, in particular, the, the New York soldiers, felt completely helpless. They had been sent to Gettysburg, and suddenly they were worried about what was happening to their wives and children back in New York City as, when the riots erupted. Um, and soldiers, of course, even further afield, felt the same way. But I think generally the, the Army reacted um, with a show of, of, uh, of solidarity, yeah. If I follow you correctly, you said that the draft thing was passed in March. Yeah. When did it actually take effect? Well, the draft was, uh, the draft law was passed and signed in March. Um, it couldn't take effect um, until there was uh, an enrollment. So, you know, one of the things that scared people about the draft, too, was that this new extension, this new um, accretion of federal power was made real and effective by a whole new bureaucracy, the Provost Marshal General's Office. 
a whole military police arm. And these men uh, were empowered to go throughout the country and arrest deserters, spies. Um, and one of their jobs was to enroll men, to literally go from house to house, um, taking names of eligible men. And so that process took several months during the spring, uh, April, May, June of, of 1863. So the draft actually became effective uh, for people once their names had been drawn from a drum uh, at, the, at the various lotteries. And of course, that, that lottery on July 13th in New York was, the, was actually the second day of the lottery. The first day was July 11th on Saturday. One yeah. Uh, actually, that's a great question. Um, did you have to be a citizen to be drafted? Not, not uh, exclusively. In fact, some of the people who were the most upset about the draft law uh, were immigrants who had recently arrived in the country and had declared their intention to become citizens. And the law specifically was written so that they would be drawn in as well. They had six months to leave the country if they <laughs> didn't want to be drafted. Yeah. It's been three years since you published your book. Uh, to what extent has your scholarship shaped the debate uh, for social history in those intervening three years, and especially in light of the bicentennial of Lincoln's birth, that uh, you see a lot of Lincoln books coming out here in the last in the last couple of years? Uh, yeah, that's a that's an interesting question. Um, you know, my my intention with the book um, and the the gap that I perceived and was hoping to fill with it was to present a, a balanced view of the social history, um, not focusing solely on the Irish or solely on the blacks, but to give um, a real texture of the experience of both groups and uh, you know, to present the, the dilemmas in a balanced way. And um, you know, this year uh, we're doing the New York Historical Society as a Jesse mentioned is doing a, a big Lincoln in New York exhibit in October. Um, and I've contributed a chapter to the book talking about the culture of opposition to Lincoln uh, in New York at the time. Uh, we're going to have a symposium there in January. Uh, James McPherson and I are going to talk about New York's reaction to the Emancipation Proclamation specifically. It's going to be a symposium, an all-day symposium on, um, the, on the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, in general, but we'll, we'll be talking about New York's reaction. So, um, you know, my hope is uh, that the, the discussion, as, as you've suggested with your question, um, has expanded, um, you know, to include not only the military aspect, but also the way in which the social history uh, informs the, the military picture. Uh, get somebody else. At the present time, is there any physical evidence in Lower Manhattan or in some of these areas where this occurred? Uh, have they, do they have any plaques up or are there any buildings that were in existence then that are marked as, so a person could go there today and, and see uh, the physical area where it happened? Is there anything like that now, there now? Yeah, there, it is possible to take a a tour of the draft riots, in a sense. Um, I, I conduct one a couple of times a year for the New York Historical Society. And as I suggested when I first began, it's not an event that um, the city is proud to commemorate <laughs> with, <laughs> with plaques or in any other fashion. But um, what I like to do is, is take people down to the seaport, uh, to South Street Seaport, where you saw the uh, the lithograph of it, um, and you can look at that same view today and see some, some, uh, a couple of tall ships that are parked there and get a feel for the time when that was the business, the central business district of, of New York City, um, and get a feel for the, the cobblestone streets. Um, and, and uh, for example, Shermerhorn Row is some of the counting houses from the early 1800s are, are still there intact. Uh, with the Fulton, um, the um, South Street Seaport Museum on Fulton Street, and you can walk up towards uh, towards the, the old Five Points neighborhood uh, and see some of the Irish Catholic churches uh, 
that were there as part of the growing uh, Irish Catholic presence in New York starting in the 1820s. Um, you can stand at the five points intersection, which only has two or three points left to it, <laughs> but you're still standing on the same spot. Um, and there are other interesting related uh, sites, for example, um, in terms of African American history, there's the African Burial Ground, which was a, a, cemetery, a major cemetery uh, that's now commemorated with a monument. You can see the, the courthouse that was built uh, under Boss Tweed's reign, the famous Tweed Courthouse that cost a ridiculous amount of money, even at the time. And uh, there's remnants of, of what was the Printing House Square, which is uh, looked upon now by a statue of Horace Greeley next to City Hall. Um, so the City Hall area is pretty much, pretty much intact. Um, there's, a, there's actually a plaque on the, the former New York Times building that I showed you in that image. There's a, a Barnes & Noble bookstore there now but <laughs> in a different building, but it's the, it's, the site is marked by a plaque. So you're, you know you're in the right general area. So yeah, there, there's certainly something to see. And you know, another way of, of looking at New York City in, this, in the Civil War era, um, I sometimes take people on tours of New York Harbor, uh, you know, on a water taxi or other um, kinds of vessels. And New York, of course, played such an important role in terms of industry. Um, I, I believe that, if this is correct, that the output, industrial output of New York City alone exceeded that of the entire Confederacy at a certain point during the war. So you have, you know, of course, the, the Greenpoint uh, shore of Brooklyn where the monitor, the ironclad monitor was launched. Um, and uh, you have the Navy Yard. Um, so you can, you can also, you know, tour New York's waterways with a view to, um, you know, some of the, the harbor forts, uh, you know, um, at, the, at the Narrows, for example, um, and uh, get a feel for the, the role of the city generally during the war. people who were so-called uh, instigators of the riot, or were, were anybody, was anybody charged with crimes in association with the rioting? And were there, what, what was the consequence yeah. of those uh, crimes? Yeah, great question. What was uh, the crime and punishment aspect? What happened after the riots? This is a, another sort of manifestation of Tammany Hall's kind of brilliant political uh, maneuvering, uh, you know, keen sense of politics is that the, the, the officials of Tammany Hall, um, the, the magistrates, the district attorney, um, were all basically Tammany Democrats. And what they did was they, they skillfully used the riots to do what, what we might call show trials, right? I mean, they, they made a loud commotion of dragging people in front of the bar of justice, um, but in fact, very few to none were actually um, put away for maybe more than six months. Um, and so what they did was they kind of gave themselves a veneer of, of lo the law and order party, um, but at the same time didn't uh, punish their own constituency to a degree that would be politically uh, inconvenient for themselves. Now, to their credit, uh, you know, part of the problem was that the, if you're talking about the legal system at the time, the laws were in some ways very bizarre in terms of the way they protected life versus property. I mean. There are recorded instances uh, where someone who had, you know, beat, beaten someone almost to death, you know, got six months, and someone who had stolen a, a, a sack full of shoes from Brooks Brothers got ten years. Um, so there were there were strange kind of inconsistencies in the law, which contributed to the, the sort of miscarriage of, of justice um, in the in the wake of the riots. Um, and so the the short answer is that very few. Uh, were, were punished severely, and probably the, the wrong ones, if any. Um, and you know, th on that same note, one might ask, what happened in terms of compensation? For example, pla black uh, New Yorkers who were burned out of their homes, and the city, um, by statute, was supposed to pay damages in cases of riot. But because of the racism of the Democratic-controlled city government, few blacks, if any, received um, just compensation, and many simply fled from the city, and their businesses were destroyed. Um, if I can just add to that, you know, I, I think a kind of interesting point to extend what you've you've started. 
I think you know one of the problems with uh, punishing or, or really trying to serve justice in the wake of an event like this was that, as Lincoln said, "What am I to do?" You know, these Union leaguers came to him and said, "Let's have an inquiry." Lincoln said, "I can't have an inquiry. I'm I'm sitting on two volcanoes. You know, I'm fighting the Civil War. I've got New York erupting. I have news of a potential conspiracy, you know, happening in Chicago with." The, the copperheads out there. Um, and Lincoln also realized that, you know, he had already stretched the limits of his executive power uh, with the suspensions of habeas corpus that had inflamed uh, the opposition so much that he realized that if he, he did what the, the Republicans in New York wanted him to do, which was to come in, impose martial law, and perhaps even execute some of the potential ringleaders of the riots, that he would be, in a sense, ruling at the point of a bayonet, and that it would erode his position even more than it would strengthen it. And so he was really caught in a dilemma uh, uh, of which uh, black New Yorkers, the victims of the riots, were, were really um, the ultimate losers in that, in that equation. It's, it's just interesting to bring it up because if we look at what happens during the later Reconstruction period in the South, President Grant, right, General Grant becomes President Grant, and he's faced with the same dilemma. By the, by the 18, late 1860s, early 1870s, the Northern zeal for pursuing Reconstruction in the South is waning. And eventually, you have to turn local government back over to local people, um, even if they're you know, elected by corrupt means, if it's Tammany Hall or it's the Redeemer governments in, in the South. Um, and that's eventually what happened with Grant as well. So um, I think it's interesting to see what the kind of sort of devil's bargains, if you will, the compromises that had to be made in the wake of the draft riots kind of prefigured what would come later. We are going to go ahead and wrap things up this evening. We'd like to take this opportunity to present Mr. Schechter with a token of our appreciation for coming down here and wait to Oh, my goodness. On behalf of Colonel James Pierce and the staff of the Army Heritage and Education Center, we are presenting you with a print of the poster that we had made in honor of your lecture to say thank you for coming down here and presenting as part of our Perspectives in Military History Lecture Series. Thank you so much. Thanks very much.